Well, good morning. Yeah, it's great to see everybody here on time this morning. You know, this is the one Sunday, of course, that everybody comes on time, right? And it's great to be able to worship together as we celebrate God and as you're celebrating your mission emphasis. I was sharing a little bit earlier that I'm actually a missionary child. I, I was born in Zululand and raised in Swaziland. And one of the things that I always appreciate about Montreal is actually my grandparents used to live in Montreal out in Verdun. And so it was in Montreal where I first experienced snow. And it was in Montreal that I first experienced a love for hockey and a love for uh, just all of the winter sports and the things that God does. But as mentioned earlier, I am presently involved with the Canadian Bible Society. I'm the director of Canadian ministry. And that really means that I have the privilege of connecting with people right across Canada when it comes to ministry and thinking about the impact of God's Word. Does God's Word continue to have an impact here in Canada? And does it continue to have an impact across this great world of ours? In 2013, the Forum of Bible Agencies here in Canada commissioned a study to look at the impact of God's Word in Canada. And it was interesting as they looked at that survey, some of the results that they discovered, and some of them were pretty horrific when it comes to Bibles and Bible engagement here in Canada. Consider these statistics. About one in seven Canadian Christians, or 14%, read the Bible at least once a week. Did you hear that? About one in seven Canadian Christians read the Bible at least once a week. Only 18% of Canadians strongly agree the Bible is the Word of God, down from 35% in 1996. The majority of Canadians, 69%, and half of Christians agree that the Bible has irreconcilable contradictions. One in seven Canadians, or about 13%, and about one in four Christians strongly agree that the Bible is relevant to modern life. Almost two-thirds of Canadians and six in ten Christians agree that the scriptures of all major world religions teach essentially the same things. Only about one in ten Canadians and two in ten Christian Canadians reflect on the meaning of the Bible for their lives at least a few times a week. And only 6% of Canadians and 11% of Christians talk to others about the Bible outside of religious services at least once a week. Is it any wonder that our culture here in Canada is declining when it comes to faith? If we cannot call ourselves back into the scriptures, back into God's word as the word of God that brings direction for life. Now, I'm sure that most of you who are here this morning are convinced when you think about the Bible that it is a guide. It helps to provide direction as you think about walking through life. I'm sure that most of you who are here this morning find that the Holy Scriptures provide encouragement for life. When you're discouraged, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling depressed, you know that you can turn to God's Word as a source of help and encouragement for life. I'm sure that most of you here this morning who have been Christ followers for any amount of years know that the Holy Scriptures give hope. When we're hopeless, the Scriptures are the place to turn to to find hope. I'm sure that most of us also know that the Holy Scriptures bring instruction. They bring instruction about how to live, how to treat people, how to treat the world that God has placed us into. And then I'm also sure that most of you here this morning also know that God's holy word brings discipline and correction. When we need to be corrected in how we live, God's word shows us how to live. Our scripture reading this morning is found in Psalm 19, and if you want to take your, red bull, your uh, green bulletin there this morning, Let's just turn to that scripture and let's listen carefully to what it is that God wants to say to us as we consider God's word this morning. Let's listen to these words. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. 
Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word this morning that brings encouragement, instruction, discipline, hope. We thank you that it shows us how to live in this world where so few people are actually engaging with your holy scriptures. And now, our Heavenly Father, we pray that you would illumine your word so that it would bring us to the place where we are obedient to your word. And we thank you for what you will choose to do. And Father, I pray the words of this passage of scripture for my own heart and for all of our hearts. May the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The question that I'd like to ask us this morning is this question, specifically in light of the Bible Engagement Survey and in light of our own interaction with the Scripture. What will I do with God's Word? Perhaps you're coming to worship this morning and you are a person who is enthusiastic about God's Word. You are convinced that it makes a difference you are convinced that it changes you and gives you life. But perhaps you're also here this morning and you're not so convinced. Perhaps you're one of those people who pick up God's word when you need to find some help and then for the rest of the time you put it aside and you let it sit there and languish on the shelf of your house. Perhaps this little video, it doesn't have any sound but it makes the point, is how you treat God's word. It would be dangerous for us this morning to ask the question, can anybody relate to this video? But there's a lot of truth in it, isn't there? That sometimes we put God's word on the shelf, we get busy with life, we go through our week, we interact with people, and then all of a sudden Sunday rolls around 
And we go and we pick up the word and we take it to church, but we've neglected it for the whole week. And so we're confronted with this question, what shall I do with the word? Will God's word bring me life or will it bring me death? In the scripture reading from this morning from Psalm 19, we see David and he's writing this beautiful psalm to us. In fact, some writers have actually described this Psalm 19 to be one of the most beautiful psalms in all of the scriptures. And as he's writing to us, he recognizes some things about God and about that interaction with the Word. And the first thing that I would suggest to you that David recognizes as he's writing these holy words is he recognizes this. God is great. He declares in the beginning of that psalm, for the heavens declare the glory of God. Now as we think about David declaring those words, I ask myself the question, when was the very first time that David recognized that God was great? Perhaps it was as he was a shepherd boy. And we know that David often used to go and he would shepherd the sheep out in the middle of the night. And perhaps it was one, on one of those nights where he looked up into the heavens and he thought to himself, the heavens declare the glory of God. Or perhaps it was on that night when he was going to give his brothers food as they were fighting in the king's army against the Philistines. And as he was walking that lonely road to the front to deliver the food, perhaps he looked up and he thought to himself, the heavens declare the glory of God. Or perhaps it was on that night when he was declared to be the next king and anointed as the next king. And he thought to himself, how can I ever do this? And maybe he gazed up into the heavens and thought to himself, the heavens declare the glory of God. It's very hard for us as modern day people to understand how great and glorious our God is. You see, we get confronted by so many things in our world that we think are great and wonderful and awesome. Perhaps it's technology. Perhaps it's a new song. Perhaps it's a new movie. We're confronted by all of those things and we see them and we think to ourselves, wow, those are great things. And we escape the things that really are significant and great. We have a little fishing cottage up in northern Ontario. We get there about once a year. It's kind of one of those cottages you only go if you're going to go fishing. And so we go to the fishing cottage. We're up in the cottage. The sun goes down. And when the sun goes down, we go for a campfire down by the dock. And as we're sitting at that campfire down by the dock with no external lights around, you gaze up into the heavens and you see the splendor of God's creation. And in that moment, it's exactly like the moment that David must have experienced when he wrote this beautiful psalm and he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. And as I stand on that dock in that remote place of northern Ontario and I gaze up into the heavens, this is the thought I have every time I'm there. There is a God. There is a God. There is a God. God reveals himself to you and to me through his general revelation of the glory and the splendor of what he has created for us. And David must have known that when he said, God is great. But interestingly enough, we know this about God's creation. The sky and the earth won't last forever. But what is it that will last forever? The words of God. The grass withers and the flowers fail but the word of our God stands for how long? Forever. And so when we get so caught up in the busyness of life and we get so caught up in neglecting God's word and we get so caught up in, involved in the things that last for a temporary time, 
we need to remind ourselves that there is something that lasts forever. The words of God. And so as David declares God is great, there is something else that he also declares in Psalm 19, and it's this. He declares that God has given us words to live by. In my Bible it reads this way. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold. God's words, His instructions for us about how to live are more precious than gold. You see, unfortunately what happens in our world, and maybe it happens with some of you, is you think about God's word as something that is restrictive. Something that holds you back. You think of it kind of like when you're driving on a major highway, and I drive all the time between Ottawa and Toronto, and so I'm always driving along the 401. And along the 401, what you often see is you see the signs that tell you how fast you are to go. 100 kilometers an hour. And I know that there are a lot of people that look at those signs and they think they're just suggestions, right? They're not suggestions. What are they? They're law. And as we see them as law, we think to ourselves, oh, that's restrictive. That's holding me back. If I can just go a little bit faster, I'll get to Toronto sooner. And sometimes we think about God's word like that. We think that God's word is simply just suggestions about how to live. And yet here's David, and he's coming to us, and he's saying, these are not suggestions. These are not even restrictive laws. These are the things that you obey so that you can know what is more precious than gold. You see, isn't that why Jesus came. I think of that wonderful passage of scripture from John chapter 1. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. We read in John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. When God sent His Son, His Word, into our world, He came into our world to show us the Father and to show us how to live, to really live. See, aren't you thankful that God simply just didn't say to us, good luck with living in this world? No. He said, I am sending my Son Jesus as an example of how you live in the world. The living word becomes the example of living in this world. This past Monday, I stood at the graveside of my wife's aunt. We stood there and we saw her body being lowered into the ground and there were many tears and there was much sadness and there was much grief. But as we were talking about this woman, this is the one thing that was consistently coming up in every conversation. Here is someone who knew the beauty of living like Jesus. And I thought to myself, wonder, what a wonderful testimony of how I want my life to be remembered. My life was one that lived like Jesus. The testimony of Aunt Kathy was this. She loved God and she loved His Holy Word, but she also loved people. And there was a beautiful coming together of God's Word and God's love for people. 
God has given us words to live by. But there was a third thing that David recognized from this beautiful passage of Scripture. And he realized this. Life is different when you encounter the Word. You see, you can no longer live like you used to live when you encounter the pure and holy Word of God. That's why David says at the end of uh, chapter 19, May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. My life is different when I encounter God's holy word. James writes it this way, Obey God's message. Don't fool yourselves by just listening to it. Be obedient to it. Apply it to life. Make it alive in who you are and what you are doing. You see, here's the reality for most of us. We choose the words we want to hear. And some of you here this morning in worship, you know, you're thinking about a lot of other things because you're choosing the words you want to hear. The best illustration I can think of this is at home, we have two teenagers. Sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they're down in the basement, perhaps they're down in the basement watching TV. And I'll shout down to them, their names are Joshua and Benjamin. I'll say, Joshua and Benjamin, can one of you come up and wash the dishes? Nothing. No movement, no energy. Silence. Joshua and Benjamin, can one of you come up and cut the grass? Nothing. Silence. No energy. But if I say, Joshua and Benjamin, it's time for supper, bang, all of a sudden they're running up the stairs, there's lots of energy, and they're right there. Why is that? They choose the words they want to hear. And the reality is that most of us are like that as well. Here is God, and He's declaring to us this morning His greatness. He's telling us that He's given us words to live by. He's saying to you and I that when you experience and encounter my word, your life is radically different. And we come to a point and we have to make a choice. Will I choose to hear and walk in obedience to God's word, or will I choose to ignore it and live life like I want to live it? At the Canadian Bible Society, here is our vision and conviction. We want to reach every person with the life-giving word of God. We are convinced at the Canadian Bible Society that when someone encounters God's Word, their lives are different. They are no longer the same. If you look very closely at our Canadian Bible Society logo, you'll notice that the seed sower is dropping four seeds. And simply, it's a good reminder that the seed sower is sowing the seeds of God's Word so lives can be radically and forever changed. Let me share with you some of the work that God is doing at the Canadian Bible Society, both here in Canada and around the world. One of our main priorities right now is in the area of the next generation. How can we sow the seeds of God's Word to the next generation of young people that are coming up, and how can we help them to encounter God's living Word? This past summer, we had a major project on this Bible. It's called the Adventure for Life Bible, specifically designed for Christian camps and camping ministry right across Canada. And so we had the privilege to distribute more than 20,000 of these Bibles into camps this past summer here in Canada. <clears throat> Here's some beautiful pictures of people that are encountering God's Word, some of them for the very first time.
This young lady on the right, her name is Lillianne. Lillianne went to a gospel camp just north of Toronto. And Lillianne, 13 years old, came to faith in Jesus Christ for the very first time this past summer because someone gave her a Bible for the very first time. And then here's a beautiful picture. This young lady is from Rainy River, Ontario. We received her story in my office and her story was like this. I am 16 years old. I went to camp this summer and at camp somebody gave me a Bible. And then she went on to say in her testimony, this was the very first time in my life that I had ever touched a Bible. You know, sometimes we think about people across the seas and overseas, and those things are important, and I am passionate for that, and I know that you are passionate for that. And yet here we have young ladies like this young lady, 16-year-old, here in Canada, touching a Bible for the very first time. As she wrote in her testimony, she went on to say, I am happy to say that God has touched my life for the very first time because of his holy word. A second priority for us is in the area of urban ministry. And so we're looking at distribution projects when it comes to areas of people who are suffering from alcohol and drug addiction. And so we've been able this past summer to distribute this Bible to a number of different places here in Canada, working with urban missions and urban centers. And what's so exciting about these Bible is it contains the beautiful testimonies of people like Charlene and John and Jessica and Justin, young people whose lives are forever changed and different because they have encountered God's holy word. It's what it's all about. Another priority for us is in the area of chaplaincy, working with chaplains that are working both in the Canadian military and also in Canadian prisons. This is the Key to Freedom Bible, specifically designed for Canadian prison ministry. Four years ago, I had a prison chaplain who came to me, and he, and he said, I need Bibles. And I said to him, how many Bibles can you give away every week? And he said to me, I can give away 75 Bibles every week. And I had to look at him that day, and I had to say to him, I can't help you. I don't have enough Bibles to give you. But that was the beginning of a story and the beginning of a project where God brought together people and resources and opportunities that this Bible was developed and established. And in the last four years, we've been able to give away more than 20,000 copies of this Bible directly into institutions where people are incarcerated in Canadian prisons. And we praise God for the opportunities and the places where this Bible is landing and where lives are encountering God's holy word for the very first time. Recently, we got this note from the Winnipeg Remand Center, and they wrote to us and they said, thank you so much for your kind and generous donation of 150 Bibles for our inmates. What a great gift. I hope you know how much the inmates appreciate this acknowledgement that they're not forgotten and that someone cares about their spiritual well-being and growth. Thank you for helping them in the effort to change their lives and to be crime and drug free. May God continue to bless you and your ministry. And so these Bibles continue to go out into Canadian prisons. And then we also have the privilege of distributing Bibles directly into the Canadian military. We're the only Bible serving agency here in Canada that has the opportunity to distribute Bibles directly into the military. And so in the last six years, we've been able to distribute more than 55,000 Bibles directly into the Canadian military. And I hope you're thinking right now that in the last couple of weeks, there's been a new emphasis about the military. There's been a new emphasis on the need for the Canadian military. And so God is going to continue to bring opportunities where we can sow the seeds of God's word directly into the Canadian military. And then another priority for us is in the area of new Canadians. We've had the privilege as the Canadian Bible Society to do a couple of things when it comes to people who are new to Canada. Some of you might have also known that for many years, the Canadian Bible Society was allowed to be present at Citizenship Court. And we were actually able to go into Citizenship Court and to stand and to be present 
with a Bible available for distribution. But a few years ago, the government actually stopped that program on us. And so as a result of the program being stopped, we were able to develop a Bible called the Word of Welcome Bible for ESL classes. And so God gave us opportunity to provide these Bibles for new Canadians as they were learning English as a second language. But in God's grace and providence, the, Canadians, the Canadian government opened up again the opportunity to be at citizenship court. And so we are presently allowed to be at every citizenship court that happens across Canada, and we are able to be present with God's holy word being distributed to new Canadians. And then another area that's a priority area for us in the area of partnerships. And so we have significant partnerships with organizations right across Canada when it comes to distributing Bibles. We have a significant project with Scripture Union Canada, and Scripture Union Canada is a major partner with us in the distribution of scriptures. And then we're also so very fortunate, and why I'm so excited about being here this morning, is we have a significant project with International Student Ministries. And Dr. Yaw Perby came to my office in Ottawa, and we sat and we talked, and, and I learned all about new students and new Canadians, and we had the incredible opportunity to resource International Student Ministries with the Word of God and with, for students right across Canada. And so we recently had this testimony from International Student Ministries. We have two non-believers and one believer at our table. So Kay, the believer, shared how this relationship with God took away his nightmares that were so terrifying, and that he had seen a psychologist at one point, psychiatrist. R and M were, were in disbelief when they heard they said, "But you look so happy now." Kay proceeded to explain that as he studied the Bible more and more. God's peace just filled him, and he became a different person. At the end of the meeting, M asked, can I borrow a Bible? Of course. What does this testimony show us? It shows us a life changed, how? By God's word. And so we're so thankful that God brings those opportunities for us. You know, it's my privilege as I represent the Bible Society to bring to you people and stories that have been radically convinced and convicted by God's word. I want to introduce you to a young girl. The young girl at the very front of this picture, her name is Eliana. Eliana is nine years old. About three months ago, Eliana's mother called me and said, Eliana is having a ninth birthday party. And at her ninth birthday party, rather than receiving birthday presents, she wants people to bring money to give Bibles to students. And so I went and I sat in their living room and I heard their story and I heard their conviction for God's word that they were so convinced and convicted that God's word changes hearts and lives. And I said, here's a Bible we're doing. It's called the Adventure for Life Bible. I'd love for you to participate in this project. And I left them and I, and I went back to Ottawa and three weeks ago, I got the call from the mother, and she said, Eliana has had her birthday party, and she wants to give you some money. And so I went back to Kitchener. And little Eliana, nine years old, presented me a little box of money, and she was so happy as she gave it to me, and she said to me these words, I'm giving you $200 to buy Bibles for students here in Canada. And as she gave me that little box of money, I started crying. And the reason I was crying is because I have a conviction that God is going to raise up a new generation of people that are going to be passionate for God's word and are going to have a desire to get God's word into the hands and hearts of people so they too can know that God's word can change lives and so it can change their hearts. And so that's some of the ministry that God is doing right here in Canada. But I just want to end this morning by telling you about some of the work that God is doing around the world. And one of the initiatives that I know that you're doing here in this congregation is the Countdown to Zero initiative. Really looking at how can we impact the world so the countdown truly can be to zero with people who know Jesus. At the Canadian Bible Society, we actually have the privilege of being involved in the Countdown to Zero initiative 
through something called the Digital Bible Library. And I'm gonna, we're just going to show a quick video on the Digital Bible Library, and then I'll just come up and close by telling you a little bit more about it. When you support the Canadian Bible Society, you support initiatives like the Digital Bible Library. It briefly mentioned in there that one of the most popular applications for the Digital Bible Library is on UVersion. And if you go to UVersion and you use UVersion as the free digital app that it is, you'll quickly discover how many languages are in there. But what's most exciting for us here in Canada is that there are a number of First Nation languages that have also been integrated into the Digital Bible Library. And so it's an incredible opportunity for God's Word to be not only here in Canada, but around the world, so that every person, every tribe in that countdown to zero has an opportunity to encounter God's Word, to know that He is great, to know that lives can be eternally changed, and to know that they are eternally different, because God is a part of who they are. So thank you for your passion for missions. Thank you for your passion for God's Word. And may God enable you to continue to be people of the Word. As you leave this morning, do not neglect your Bible. But may it become an active and integrated part of everyday living so that you too can continue to exhibit Jesus Christ. May God bless you.